I think we'll get started just because we have a, a hard stop at three o'clock. So um, I want to get this moving so we can get to questions as well. Um, so what we're going to do here is, of course, um, for our folks, if you could all stay muted, um, we're going to have our presenters uh, go through um, some information for us. After that, we'll open it up to questions. If you do have a question, I ask you to please add, um, let us know through chat. Just let us know that you have a question. And Kat is our Zoom expert, and we'll call on you when it's your time to ask a question. Whatever question we don't get to today, um, please email me whatever questions you have. What I'll do is I'll collect them, send them all over to uh, Jillian to get answers for us and send them to the caucus, as well as a copy um, of this presentation that we're um, going to that we're recording. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Sen Vermond, Dean of School of Public Health. And um, again, I just want to thank all of you for joining us and uh, and helping us out put this together. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate the uh, the invitation to speak to our colleagues in uh, public service, uh, helping. Uh, uh, manage our state and uh, policies in our state and we're very grateful for all your public service we really mean that um, and uh, we are a private university as you know but we are the only school of public health in the state of connecticut and we do feel uh those of us who are on the faculty of the school of public health a very strong um obligation to help our uh a community uh, in any way that we can at any time that we can. So we've been busy campers uh, in the past 10 months, given the uh, unprecedented uh, um, uh, respiratory pandemic threat that has washed over our state on two separate occasions. Uh, back in April, as you recall uh, vividly, the hospitals of the state were completely redefining their their clinical profile, we had to establish two new ICU floors, uh, which we did in the Smilo Cancer Hospital because they were already prepared to use negative pressure rooms. And we had more people in the ICU than we've ever had in our history. We've had more people on ventilators by far than we've ever had in our history. And every hospital in the state uh, uh, virtually could say the same thing. Um, that was a, a dark time, uh, the month of March, April, May, and we were very pleased with progress in the state through the summer. And um, much as we epidemiologists predicted, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist and a pediatrician, much as we had predicted, the colder weather driving people indoors uh, was going to be friendly to viral spread. That's true for all the respiratory viruses. That's true for respiratory syncytia virus, rhinoviruses, influenza viruses, uh, the four coronaviruses that caused the common cold that predated SARS, uh, for the enteroviruses, a big family of respiratory viruses that are more common in the wintertime. There's something about cooler, um drier weather that's friendly to viruses and you can imagine how indoor living is very friendly to viruses because now you can transmit person to person with great alacrity so um we have seen the surge that we predicted it came a little earlier than we had hoped and we now have numbers in the state that are not dissimilar from those in april if you don't feel as panicked now as you did in April, that's because death rates are down. We're not seeing anywhere near the death rates that we saw in April. And there are three reasons for that. Number one, we're uh, much uh, better at uh, uh, testing and diagnosing and earlier management as outpatients. Number two, we're much better at caring for the sickest patients in the hospital all sorts of things we're doing now that we didn't know to do back in April. For example, anticoagulation, prone positioning, um, to try to delay people going on to ventilators, ventilator management, all of these things have transformed. And then we have a few drugs that we didn't have back then. Uh, we know more about use of steroids, for example. And, um, and then also um, we have a very, 
much uh, uh, stronger. Um, uh, we have many more cases that are in young people and they're less likely to, if they end up coming to the hospital because they're very sick, they're less likely to end up on ventilators. So all those reasons are why death rates are lower. But incidence rates are just what they were back in, in April, which is very disappointing. Um, still, we're doing better than many of our sister states. Uh, my home state of Wisconsin, where I grew up, is in dire straits. The Dakotas, where I had relatives, uh, these Norwegian-American relatives, uh, they, they're suffering. So plenty of states doing worse than we are. Um, it's all about the uh, classic public health measures that we've known about for decades, sometimes for centuries. We know that masks can reduce respiratory viral transmission. We know that physical distancing can help. We know that smaller groups uh, are mathematically going to protect us. We know that uh, air quality that uh, Professor Pollitt is going to tell, talk to you about in a moment is vital. We know that outdoor activities are better than indoor when the weather permits. We know that testing and contact tracing when it's vital and uh, prompt can be a, a valuable tool. And of course, the vaccines are on their way. Congratulations to uh, the federal government for their work in um, spearheading this. Congratulations to our scientists and, and both in academia and private industry for their creativity. So I can talk a little bit about uh, vaccines and then turn it over to uh, Dr. Pollitt. Um, uh, I don't think uh, I'm going to tell you anything you don't already know, but uh, we do have the two vaccines, one licensed, one soon to be licensed. Uh, we think we have several more that are in the pipeline in, um, in uh, advanced stage clinical trials. So we're going to start rolling these vaccines out uh, in sequential months, probably one in January, probably one more in March, probably one more by April. And, um, and uh, the FDA is doing uh, a yeoman's job to try to get these reviewed uh, with alacrity and the, and the uh, maturity of the proposals coming from the companies is very impressive. I just was on the phone uh, this very moment with Peter Marks, who had CBER, the Center for Biologic Evaluation uh, Research at, uh, at the FDA, and he has uh, worked and his team over time in trying to meet, he's a, by the way, an old Yaley. But the point is that, uh, that uh, we aren't going to see a lot of impact on the uh, epidemic, uh, the transmission dynamics from vaccines alone. We simply aren't gonna have enough people vaccinated to bend the curve thanks to vaccines. But by, end, by beginning of summer, we should be in the phase where we're doing, you know, tens of thousands of vaccines in the next rung of individuals. First, we're going in healthcare workers, long-term care facility providers, and 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 um, and uh, clients, and then we hope to get to teachers, prisoners, teachers, students as a next rung. Uh, I'm hoping the arts community can be uh, can be given a break. Uh, a lot of these are going to go bankrupt if they can't, uh, they can't, and a lot of industries that depend on group work, uh, a lot of blue collar industries, we're hoping to get to them. So if we have enough vaccine and we have enough agreement to take the vaccine, if we can overcome the vaccine hesitancy, then we may have, uh, we may be flirting with herd immunity, which we think is going to take minimum 60% coverage, and it may it may need between 75, 85% coverage, probably somewhere in that range between 60 and, and 85% is where we achieve herd immunity, where the viral transmission dies out because it doesn't have enough uh, susceptible people to get infected. So that's my quick introduction. Happy to take uh, questions later on, but I think it's important we get to Dr. Pollitt, Dr. Crawford, and Dr. Cooper for their vital, uh, their vital contributions on uh, systems approaches to ma maximize health and safety. Um, our environmental engineer, Dr. Crystal Pollitt, then we're going to talk about um, mathematical modeling and predicting where the epidemic is now and where it's gonna go. Dr. Forrest Crawford has been working uh, tirelessly with the state on those issues. 
and then economic challenges where our uh, uh, associate professor of health policy, Professor Zach Cooper, uh, will be commenting. So Crystal, without further ado. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my, my slides. Can everyone see that? I see nodding heads, great. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I was asked to speak about um, health approaches and um, I will just do an, an overview of what we know about the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 um, and then how we can protect ourselves and I'll be sharing some information um, that Dr. Vermond and I have prepared for, for different organizations and strategies um, that can be used um, to minimize risk. So uh, I'll start here, and this is this is likely information that you've all heard before, you're familiar with, but just um, um, to go through the primary uh, routes of uh, transmission, uh, the most notable one um, that we're very familiar with are these ballistic droplets, so these larger droplets that are released from coughing and from sneezing. So these are projectiles that need to have direct contact, a fairly small um, contact area like the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Um, and this is primarily um, transmission will result through co close personal contact. Uh, the other route of transmission that has gained um, a fair amount of attention in recent months, acknowledgement from the WHO and from CDC uh, are through aerosols. So these are smaller sized um, respiratory particles that are released from a number of different respiratory activities. Um, such as uh, simply breathing from talking, singing, yelling, as well as um, coughing and sneezing as well. So they're being, they're smaller sized aerosols that are released. They contain viral material. And because of their size, they're able to travel much further. So uh, any of these particles are typically less than 100 microns in um, diameter. So to set some context to that, a strand of human hair is typically 50 to 70 microns. Um, these aerosols can travel up to 100 plus meters, uh, depending on the environment in which they're released. And we can then have transmission through inhalation. And this really sets the grounds for the uh, potential for long range transports. Uh, and then finally, uh, surfaces have been um, widely discussed as a route of transmission. Um, but as evidence evolves, we realize that this is a far less relevant um, form of transmission for SARS-CoV-2. So for each one of these, these pathways and these routes of transmission, we're really looking at different infectious disease control measures that are going to be relevant and trying to layer these different approaches is going to lead to the greatest amount of risk uh, reduction. So when we think about the different um, control measures that um, are feasible and that have been applied, um, we know that universal masking is by far um, the best approach um, and has um, the best, um, offers the best amount of risk reduction. Um, so as we introduce the source control through masks and also combined with physical distancing, so really trying to achieve that minimum six foot distancing um, to avoid transmission from these uh, ballistic droplets, we can then further layer that on to address airborne transmission from aerosols. And the key strategies that we're thinking about here are moving events outdoors, gathering in spaces outdoors, because we know that the risk outdoors is inherently less than in indoor spaces. When we think about indoor spaces, we're really looking to increase the amount of ventilation, so the amount of outdoor air that we can bring in uh, into the indoor space, as well as filtration. So how can we start to impact any of these potentially viral containing aerosols onto some surface so they're no longer um, airborne? And through those different measures there, um, and also through different um, hand washing techniques and also surface disinfection, which has been um, very popular um, in terms of public health um, strategies that have been communicated. So layering these different approaches is absolutely essential to um, overall reducing and having the greatest amount of risk reduction. Now when we're thinking about how to actually implement these, these strategies, uh, we've been working with a number of organizations and thinking about what are different ways organizations can implement these approaches and have come up with these two strategies of a top-down approach and bottom-up approaches that are necessary to have the maximum effect for risk reduction. So we think that this bottom-down effect, so an organization-led approaches for um, disease control, um, we're thinking about ways that they can eliminate contact, so remote environments like we're doing right now, a number of administrative controls, so introducing smaller groups, pods, physical distancing, surface cleaning, outdoor spaces, 
and then a number of engineering controls that can also be introduced. And I'll speak to these in a little bit more um, detail, such as the vent ventilation and filtration. But as we think about all these approaches, it's essential to acknowledge that without an, an individual led risk reduction, that those are done by modification of personal behaviors like mask wearing and just personal hygiene with hand washing, um, none of these um, effectiveness of risk reduction is possible. Now I'm happy to share the slide, it's a little bit busy, but this is in a strategy that we adapted to then start looking at engineering control measures that can be introduced into environments. Um, so this was um, available online as well, the URL for uh, a school guidance um, document that was compiled together with Dr. Vermont and a number of um, other faculty members and students within the Yale School of Public Health is where we walk through the different strategies that a building can implement um, to try to minimize um, the risk of infection. We walk through different strategies for buildings that are mechanically ventilated, so have an HVAC system, and also those that don't have an HVAC system, so they're naturally ventilated. And just to highlight some different approaches here, we can walk through a building space that is mechanically ventilated. And we're, we're looking here to maximize the amount of outdoor air that's brought into that space, enhance the amount of filtration that any recirculated air within that space is using. So introduction of at least MERV 13 filters, and then increase the amount of, re, of um, airflow into these spaces. So trying to achieve a minimum of at least five to six air changes in each room um, per hour. We also then look at um, naturally ventilated spaces, so places that don't have um, a centralized ventilation system. And here we're really like maximizing low cost solutions that can be implemented, such as opening windows and use of uh, portable air cleaners um, that can be used. We worked with a number of different schools over the summer to um, facilitate their reopening to lead to safer environments for the children, um, the administrators and the teachers within these environments. Um, we had the pleasure of visiting a number of these schools and interacting um, with the staff there. Um, so here's a picture of one of my PhD students, Elizabeth Lynn and Dr. Vermont in a Bridgeport school. We're really be able to address a lot of these engineering controls as well as a number of administrative issues that they could do to make the classroom spaces safer. I'll highlight just a couple of um, solutions that we found to be very effective. Um, we were really trying to look at these low cost strategies for a number of different organizations um, and we're heavily recommending uses of box vans. So these are $20 um, units that um, can be purchased from any hardware shop online from Amazon. And by simply putting them into the window, um, and directing air out of the space, um, it's a very uh, inexpensive way of uh, achieving maximum airflow. So about 1,000 to 2,000 cubic feet per minute can be uh, forced out of that space um, to allow for enhanced um, ventilation within there. We were also suggesting use of air cleaners, commercially available devices, as well as low cost devices, so DIY devices um, that can be used to allow for supplemental filtration um, and reduce the amount of potentially viral um, containing aerosols within a space. So I note here that a number of commercial de available devices are available on the market, a little bit of expensive ranging from about 200 um, plus dollars depending on the model. But absolutely critical to select the right unit for your space so making sure that you are not putting a too small of a unit in a very large space. Uh, any model that is purchased should have, be certified and will contain information on um, the appropriate use. And I insert this um, URL here um, as a very good tool that was developed by researchers at um, UC Boulder and Harvard um, to help with decision making. We've also published a number of guidance um, on how you can do this yourself um, for about $20 to $50 um, and just simply put a furnace filter um, onto the front of a box fan and that's an incredibly effective way at removing airborne aerosol from the space um, on a budget. Just to give you an indication on how well this works, this is a picture of a unit that was assembled with a very simple fan, a furnace filter that was about $20, and you can see that this blackened area here um, is how effective it was at scrubbing out um, the particles from the air. And I'll leave you with one final other approach that has become very popular for recommending is the use of carbon dioxide as a proxy for occupancy um, and ventilation within an indoor space. 
There are commercially available devices, such as the one shown on the bottom here, that monitor um, carbon dioxide. So exhaled carbon dioxide, as it will increase within a space, will be an indicator for the number of occupants within um, the space and also the amount of ventilation, so the amount of air that's being um, fresh air introduced. Um, we know that there are typical baseline levels and as uh, levels start to rise, um, that can be an indicator um, that more ventilation um, is needed. These devices are really quite inexpensive, about $100 a piece and a great numeric um, quantitative indicator um, if there should be an alert within a space that there's insufficient ventilation and potentially an increased risk for transmission. And so with that note, I'll just wrap up by suggesting some more information um, that is available, material that we've prepared um, at the Yale School of Public Health um, together with Dr. Vermont, um, a package for um, school reopenings. Um, we've done a number of consultations with arts venues um, across the state of Connecticut and um, webinars as well throughout um, the summer months. So I encourage you to look at this resource. And then finally, um, the collaboration that I've had with a number of other aerosol scientists um, is a great resource to frequently ask questions related to airborne transmission. And then finally, my email if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. That was a lot of material, but uh, let's go on to Forrest, uh, and then uh, we'll go on to Zach, and then we'll go to questions. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Forrest Crawford. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Biostatistics at the Yale School of Public Health, and uh, I'll talk to you today about uh, forecasting, uh, trying to guess what will happen next with the COVID-19 pandemic in the state of Connecticut. Um, so decision makers like yourselves and uh, other elected officials, public health officials need to be able to predict the burden of COVID-19 infection cases, hospitalization and death, all the things that we are trying to avoid. Uh, and typically decision makers do these things um, by implementing interventions like uh, social distancing, business sector regulations, stay at home orders like the one the governor made in March uh, of 2020. Uh, also, uh, we need to know what's going on in order, in order to allocate uh, testing resources, um, uh, hospital capacity and supplies, outbreak responses, and of course now the vaccine which is being rolled out um, throughout the world. Uh, and also, as conditions permit, to use this information to reopen business sectors and schools, permit larger gatherings, and basically improve our lives so that we can go back to normal uh, at some point as soon as possible. Now, this is a really challenging task. Uh, so starting in early April, uh, me and uh, a few other collaborators uh, began working on constructing mathematical models of COVID-19 transmission in Connecticut for the Department of Public Health. And, uh, and this went well, the models went well, they predicted um, what was going to happen uh, with throughout the first wave of uh, COVID in Connecticut. Uh, but the thing that these models lacked and the, and the thing that we wished we had at the time was more information about what people are actually doing on the ground, the factors that drive uh, transmission from one individual to another. So Connecticut, through the Department of Public Health, um, tracks the pandemic using metrics, uh, things like cases, hospitalization, death. They monitor uh, information from the hospitals um, and, and uh, testing results. These are all really good things to monitor, but they lag disease transmission by days or weeks. And that means it's very hard to predict where and when new outbreaks will occur, uh, where testing uh, resources need to be deployed, where social distancing needs to be enhanced, uh, and potentially where, uh, where we can relax a little bit. Um, so we know that COVID is transmitted through close interpersonal contact between individual people. And the question was, can we quantitatively measure this close contact as it happens throughout the state and use that information to try to predict where new cases would arise, where new outbreaks would happen. So we analyzed commercially available mobile device location data to measure likely close contact between individuals within two meters, six feet in Connecticut. Uh, our private sector partner is a company called Whitespace Solutions, it's a geoanalytics company based in Washington, DC. Um, when we gather information about mobile devices, uh, there's no individually identifying information that's used. All the data are aggregated at the town and census block group level. Um, and I'll show you what all of this looks like on the next slide. So here are a series of maps showing 
the frequency of close interpersonal contact between two people who don't live together in the state of Connecticut from March 2020 to roughly the present or, or early December. And each of these maps shows you is uh, one month apart. Dark red means a lot of close contact within six feet between individuals who don't live together. And you can see uh, that uh, in early March, there was a lot of contact in all the populous areas in the state. And by the end of March, early April, uh, that contact had dropped dramatically down uh, to near zero in some places. And then it's been slowly increasing throughout the summer and into the fall. Down at the lower left-hand corner, you can see the trace of contact rate relative to February baseline uh, throughout the, the time course of the pandemic. So you can see it was really high and very high on weekdays especially. Uh, the dips are on weekends in February. Uh, and then about one week before the governor issued the stay-at-home order, contact throughout the state dropped really dramatically and, uh, and nearly hit zero. Uh, and then slowly began to rise throughout the summer. We, uh, the state got to phase one and phase two reopening, if you recall. Uh, those, uh, those phases allowed more types of businesses to resume more normal practices. More types of gatherings happened in September uh, and in late August and in September, schools began to reopen universities. Many of them reopened for in-person classes. Um, phase three began in um, October and then phase 2.1, we reverted to phase 2.1 in November as case counts began to rise again. So Connecticut has, has had kind of a, a roller coaster of, uh, of waves of COVID uh, over the last um, nine months. And, uh, and the contact information that I'm showing here explains at least in part why that is, uh, why we experienced a very strong surge at the beginning, very rapid decline that permitted uh, a fairly fast reopening schedule throughout the summer, and then a resurgence in the fall uh, following reopening of schools and, uh, uh, and then to where we are currently. So now this is the information that we have uh, about the state as a whole. Uh, if you are interested in this, I invite you to go to this website. We created an interactive application where you can explore uh, information about the frequency of close contact within every municipality in the state and in every census block group in the state. So that's a very small geographic unit. Um, and you can track what it looks like over time. And I'll show you a few trends if you're interested. And our vision for this information uh, for the general public, for businesses, for the state, is to help us understand uh, where we need to encourage social distancing, where distancing is failing and where to direct testing and case finding resources so that we can find people who may be infected and help them get tested and isolated. So here's some places of interest in Connecticut. On the left, uh, we have uh, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun at the top. You can see that in February, both of these places had huge events over weekends uh, and those dropped down basically uh, to zero um, after the casinos were closed reopened around June 1st, and you can see increasing weekend activity throughout the summer, uh, but the casinos are nowhere near the level of contact uh, that we saw in February. Uh, so it's possible that cancellation of those big weekend events like concerts um, has dramatically, uh, has been responsible for this dramatic reduction in contact. Uh, Mystic reopened over the summer. Uh, the seaport was very popular, probably not as popular as usual in July, August, September. Um, but, uh, but contact was still very high compared to other places in the state. Um, Connecticut Post Mall, just to take one mall as an example, see very high weekend, uh, close interpersonal contact, basically rising and then plateauing throughout the summer with much higher weekend contact throughout uh, the fall. Uh, some educational institutions on the right-hand side, Sacred Heart showed the, the largest uh, increase in contact immediately upon reopening. And there, this was followed by outbreaks at Sacred Heart. Uh, same thing at Fairfield University, really stark uh, increase in, in contact upon reopening. A big signal at UConn, uh, but, uh, but I think they took very strong measures very quickly and, uh, and students were contacting each other much less after the initial couple of cases among new students returning, or among students returning to, uh, to the college campus and very little activity at Yale. Uh, compared to February baseline. 
So all of this we can see roughly in real time and the level of contact in these different locations, uh, possibly attributed to uh, people going to these venues or people attending these universities, uh, can tell us a lot about where uh, transmission is likely to be happening, where outbreaks are likely to occur. This doesn't tell us that transmission must be happening or that it is happening, but rather it tells us where conditions are right for an outbreak to occur. A couple of malls uh, that I thought were interesting, uh, I've highlighted here on the right hand side, uh, this is the Black Friday spike in close interpersonal contact at retail establishments, uh, corresponding to these big uh, mall areas. Um, so you can see there's been a lot of activity, a lot of shopping activity, and really a lot, especially in uh, Farmington and Danbury, um, corresponding to Black Friday shopping. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I think we, we should expect a lot of contact happening uh, related to holiday shopping. We should be aware that uh, this creates a transmission risk for the people who are engaging in that shopping. Um, and the businesses that are involved uh, would do very well to try to mitigate risks to the shoppers and to their employees um, in these situations. Uh, and I also want to say that we're not attributing contact or COVID transmission to specific establishments, right? I'm not trying to call out any particular business, just pointing out that the census block group that contains uh, these big uh, shopping areas account for a very large percentage of the total contact, the total close contact that is experienced by people in Connecticut on a given day, and especially during these uh, big shopping days. So this is just sort of a, a, a little bit of the information that we are using to try to predict uh, and project COVID-19 cases and outbreaks in Connecticut. This is information we share with the State Department of Public Health and, uh, and that we hope will be useful to, to you, to business owners, to the general public uh, in understanding the COVID risk uh, as we go forward. So we're doing a lot of other things. We have a lot of technical materials about this project uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about any of it. I invite you to visit the interactive web application if you're interested in exploring and clicking and dragging the map. Uh, it's pretty interesting to explore the areas where you go or where you might live or where people you know live uh, to see what's going on in those places. And I'm happy to take questions uh, at the end. So thank you very much. That's wonderful work, Forrest. Uh, we're going to go straight to Zach. Zach Cooper uh, in the Department of Health Policy and Management also the deputy director of the Tobin Center for um, Economic, what is it, Zach? Yeah, for Economic Policy. Policy, I knew it. Okay, there you go. Well, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for, uh, for having us. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to, to get to share this. I really wanna do two things. Um, first, I wanna share, I think, the emerging consensus in the economics community about sort of how we're thinking about COVID and, and the rest of the economy. And then I want to share five facts, which I think are just sort of vital as we think about next steps and, and what to do going forward. You know, before I sort of get there, I do, you know, I, I have put my contact details up, I put my cell phone on here. The, the reason I think all of us are so eager to help is I think this is really going to be the biggest challenge in our collective lifetimes. And, I think it's easy to get numb to the scale of the death we've experienced as a country um, over the last nine months, and we're gonna to continue to experience over the next six to 12. I think it's just worth pointing out, by the end of this, we're going to have lost more Americans than we lost in World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, the first Iraq War, the second Iraq War, Afghanistan 9-11, and likely all of those events combined. Um, so this is really a sort of enormous just event that we're having to, to navigate. The, yeah, I think the, the broad consensus, and, and economists are sort of notorious for not achieving consensus, but the, the sort of consensus among academic economists is really that the, the single best thing we can do for the economy is to control the spread of the virus. That is broadly the economic activity is going to be depressed, it's going to be throttled down 
as long as the public fears that if they go out, they're going to bump into other contagious people and get sick and get their families sick. And so the way we're going to stimulate activity and the way we're going to get back to normal is really by, by getting to grips with the, the pandemic itself. You know, I think what we face now is a very, very challenging six months until there is widespread vaccination. And I think now is the time to sort of redouble the, the testing, social distancing, mask use, and contact tracing. And I think one of the things Sten talked about that's so tremendously important, that's very, very closely linked with economic activity, is stopping our hospitals from getting overwhelmed. I think if we get back to where we were sort of end of March, early April, we're going to see with, with sort of saying, look, we're at our breaking point. That's when you're going to begin to see another sort of really large contraction in economic activity. I think it's often framed as a, a tension between public health and economics. Uh, again, I, I think the consensus of the economic community is very much that there isn't a tension. In fact, that it's you do the public health measures to get the economy back going. Um, I think that does mean trade-offs. And what I'm going to show you is that the pandemic has hit different groups harder than others. And I think this is where it's so vital to pair public health measures, um, particularly closures, with financial aid. There are just people who are struggling tremendously that we need to support. So let's sort of just go through, I think, five facts that I think are, are vital. And then it's a good point to sort of jump over to, to questions. I think the first thing we need to think about is the scaling of the issue we're facing from an economic perspective. The, the drop that we experienced in gross domestic product and, and output from the US economy in the, the first, second quarter of, of 2020 was literally the largest contraction of GDP we've ever experienced at one time in this country. Um, you can see here the, the scaling of the, the drop in GDP in the Great Recession versus the contraction that we experienced in the second quarter of 2020. Um, it was absolutely enormous. And I think it's just worth taking a step back and sort of saying, well, you're going through something like that. It's almost hard to appreciate just how big it was. Um, so that's gonna be fact one. Fact two, and this is sort of related to this first rule of, of pandemic economics, and it's, it's related to, to some of what actually Forrest was, was talking about which is that the contraction in economic activity precedes the formal government closures and lockdowns. And there's now really, really good evidence out there. So sort of zero on this graph, this is gonna be different forms of economic activity on the, the x-axis. This is days before and after various state government lockdowns. It all preceded all of the slowdowns, government intervention by two weeks. And there's really good data out there using cell phone data, looking at people on either side of borders where there were different policies on, on each side. And it turns out everyone in the region slowed their activity at about the same time before the government took action. And again, this is consistent with this idea that the reason we're seeing slowdowns isn't because folks are being told to stay inside, to not go out, there, there's eating. It really is because people are just afraid to, to go out. And what we need to do is put in place policies that mitigate the virus so that we lessen that fear. The fact, the third fact that I want to point out, and this is uh, for me fascinating, um, areas that had more COVID cases per 100,000 people after the fact had bigger reductions in consumer spending. So this is going to be the correlation on the, the x-axis here with people with COVID. So these are areas with more COVID cases. And this is going to be the economic contraction on the y-axis that they experience. Again, this is a lesson we just need to do internalize. The, the better a job we do constraining the pandemic, the more economic activity we're gonna see. Um, and I, I think it's just sort of hard to, to overstate this. And you know, this is work from colleagues Raj Chetty and, and others. There are five to six very, very good studies that all show something very, very similar. Fact four, is that I think we need to be very cognizant of the fact that different industries have fared very differently through the pandemic. The pandemic on the leisure, hospitality, and retail industries. 
restaurants in particular have just borne a, a tremendous brunt. And you can sort of think and juxtapose that to professional services who've broadly seen employment stay stable over the course of the pandemic versus a 20 to 22% drop in employment in the leisure industry. Focusing on Connecticut as a whole, you actually see an increase in professional service jobs, but you see an eight to 10% decrease in retail, a 15% decrease in leisure and hospitality. Now, how do we support these industries going forward? And again, one of the things I've marked on this graph are the, the dates when Connecticut uh, closed their schools, which is the, the, the diploma or the person wearing a, a mortar board here and then some of the, the more formal policies. What you see again is that the contraction in employment preceded the, the state's policies. But it's really pretty unrelated to policy. It's related to what's happening on the ground. Fact five, and, and for me, this is probably the most important slide that, that I'll put out. I think a lot of the folks in policymaking positions, folks on this call, folks like us, folks who use Zoom day to day, are in an incredibly fortunate position where the pandemic has been broadly inconvenient, um, but not financially crippling. Whereas we've seen 20% drops in employment for folks who are earning the lowest wages in the state and across the country. Um, so those are first the groups that I think had the least amount of, of backstop for, for any financial shock. They've then experienced the largest shocks through the pandemic. This is the nation as a whole, where we've actually seen high wage work, we've actually seen more employment there, a drop in, in low wage work. In the state of Connecticut, again, we've seen a 22% reduction in employment for folks, folks earning less than about $30,000. This sort of brings me to, to my final point, which is how do we navigate going forward? And you know, I, I think a couple stats are, are, are vital. About 40% of the country can work remotely, 60% cannot. And I think the experience of this pandemic for those two groups just look wildly, wildly different. The second is we know that poor Americans have lost their jobs in higher frequency than rich Americans, right? That's gonna exacerbate inequality. I think the third is that these trends are gonna be turbocharged by what's happening in the stock market. So about half the country owns stock of the stock in the US is owned by 10% of the country and the stock market is absolutely booming. So people who are in this professional class who own stock have actually seen their worth go up. Those without stock are both losing their jobs and not being exposed to the gains. And this for me is the sort of recipe for inequality, social divisions, and just so cultural and economic dislocation. This is really the, the challenge that I think we're gonna to have to navigate going forward. So what do we do? Um, the evidence on masks is clear and consistent. Um, just take a look at Kansas, where some states, or some counties enforced mask orders, some did not. You saw real reductions in COVID in the counties that enforced mask uh, requirements, a doubling of COVID cases in areas that didn't. Um, testing is vital. Um, it's what's gonna pull the sick out of the transmission cycle. We've gotta stop hospitals from getting overwhelmed. I think it's critical for state leaders, civic and, and elected officials to set the tone on vaccination. The more people we get pub, uh, vaccinated, the sooner we're getting everyone covered, the, the sooner we're out of this. And I think the final point is the view from the economics community is that it's probably impossible to do too much to address the pandemic that the way you're gonna stimulate activity isn't through stimulus alone, it's gonna be by targeting the pandemic itself. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Stan and, and we're happy to take any questions that, that y'all have. Thank you, Zach, Forrest, and Crystal. Uh, we're serious about the questions. Dive in, uh, any question is fair game, even if we did, even if none of the four of us talked about the topic, 
we might know something about it. One of us might know something about it. So please, any? So for our folks who might have joined late, please, um, if you have a question, send a message through chat and let us know you have a question and chat will call on everybody uh, in order of um, as they come in. Okay. And then you can unmute and ask your question. Pat, do you have anybody yet? Uh, yes, uh, Mark Anderson. No, I just saw on the last slide that thousand dollar value. Wanted to know what that meant, how the per test for COVID test. Yeah, absolutely, Representative Anderson. So one of the things that we did early on was try to figure out how much we should be paying per test. And you know, given the the scale of the loss of life from COVID and then the scale of the economic contraction when uh, there's higher spread, we put a, a sort of rough guesstimate together about what the willingness to pay should be for each COVID test. And you can get a number that's upwards of $1,000 per test. Um, we want people taking tests. I think what we should be hoping for as a country is sort of subsidizing tests for everybody to get them. Um, in the early days, we spent a lot of time with the, the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services trying to get them to pay more for tests. Um, part of the reason we had such a big shortage in the early days is they were paying about $30 to $40 per test, and providers were, were literally losing money doing COVID tests. Managed to get that increase to, to $100 per test. Uh, I'd be comfortable with us paying up to $1,000 per test. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, David Tigliano. Did you want to ask a question? I didn't know if Dr. Pettit or anything wanted to go first. I was just doing them in order. Um, just figured that was easiest. Well, my first question was on your contact tracing model that you were showing, the activity. How do you know that those people were close to one another in order to get the, the virus? I mean, were you just yeah. assuming because people were gathering or going back to school that they were getting near each other? Or how do you know there was a spike at the mall? I mean, what metric were you using to show that people were next to each other we know where their mobile devices were but what and if they're out we, in the parking lot doing a pickup from macy's i mean wouldn't it ping the same tower uh no so we can we triangulate uh, so we know precisely where they are and we have an estimate of the uh horizontal uncertainty in that location and so for every pair of mobile devices we can compute the probability that they are within two meters so this is it's not a measure of density uh, it's not just a, a measure of how many uh, devices are pinging the same tower. It's it's literally uh, distance measured in meters between pairs of devices. So that's how we know. Okay. You know, the, the whole issue of contact tracing is an interesting one because we're very busy with classic contact tracing, but we're also doing research around digital contact tracing the use of um, Bluetooth technologies to actually measure when people are in closer proximity. That's really only suitable for institutional environments, but it could be very helpful in schools, businesses, factories, uh, prisons, um, hospitals, uh, to, to have sort of electronic instantaneous contact tracing. And I think we've done a great job, our engineering friends, figuring out the privacy protections for that. We're using technologies that are better than banks, so. So I should, I should clarify that this, this project is not related to digital contract tracing uh, as, as is done with uh, mobile phones and Bluetooth. Uh, the state of Connecticut has a program, Apple and Google have uh, uh, programs for digital contact tracing. All of those programs are retrospective. Somebody gets diagnosed with COVID, uh, their mobile device ID is registered in the system, a message goes out to all the devices of other people they've come into contact with uh, previously to alert them that a contact of theirs uh, has tested positive. So it's all linked to testing. The, the, the data that I showed you is not linked to any public health system. It's not linked to testing. It just measures the frequency of close interpersonal contact. Do, do people have to opt in to have their phone readable or do you just have access to this information another way? it's commercially available. So you can opt out on your cell phone by uh, turning off location tracking. Uh, but the, uh, the data sets are, are the same ones that are commercially available. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, so, so people opt in when they install apps on their mobile devices. Okay, I'm good for now, Kat. Thanks. Um, we have Patrick Callahan. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I didn't put it on my title there. I'm uh, being sworn in on January 6th, so I'll, I'll be one of the representatives up in Hartford. Uh, the drawback of, uh, of getting people vaccinated is getting them educated to uh, side effects or, or absence of side effects. Can you tell us anything about what you've heard about the side effects of these uh, vaccines? The uh, unique RNA vaccines, the first time we've ever deployed such a vaccine, have had no measurable side effects other than the occasional sore arm from the diluent. Um, and um, we don't expect there to be side effects. You know, it's not DNA material. It doesn't integrate into a host genome. It's simply an RNA fragment that, that tells the cellular machinery to produce a protein. So we're very optimistic about the side effect profile. You may have heard about the AstraZeneca product, which is a live vector. And uh, they did have one uh, neurological case, a, a serious neurological case. And they don't know if that was just background disease. You know, when you do a study of 30,000 people, you're going to have a few people get sick and they were destined to get sick having nothing to do with the vaccine. So it's sometimes tricky to sort out when you have a single side effect and whether it's vaccine related. But there are, once you see the side effect, there are animal studies, there are other studies one can do to try to get to the bottom of that. And that's what they're in the process of doing now. So I'm not saying all uh, COVID vaccines are going to be safe all of the time, but I can say that the killed products, the RNA products, the likelihood of them having any serious side effects is close to nil. And then some of the live vector products have done well in other vaccines, but we need to see if they'll do well in this one. Uh, so the, the jury's out on, on a number of them since they're still in clinical trials. But the two that are coming down the pike, Pfizer that's gonna go into the arms of, of, uh, of healthcare workers around the state on Monday, um, and, uh, and Moderna probably in the arms of many of us uh, in a few months, a couple months at the most, uh, those we think are very, very safe. Good question, thanks. And by the way, when we talk about, when we think about um, uh, side effects can be a sore arm, but then there are adverse effects and that's somewhat different concept. So side effects are, you know, you get a shot, you have a sore arm. Um, but uh, adverse effects are things that we're really worried about. I guess that should have been my question then, Dr. Sorry. No, no, I, I should have clarified right up front. Because it's, you know, we, we talk about side effects and lots of things have side effects. You take, you take a pill, you have an upset stomach, that's a side effect. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take the pill. But if, if I get a vaccine and I get transverse myelitis, a serious, you know, autoimmune disorder of the neuro, ner nervous system, if the vaccine caused it, we don't want to use that vaccine. So Stan, I think what he's asking is, what do you see about the incidence of adverse events with vaccination? Extremely low for the products that are coming onto the market in the near future. And I don't think the FDA is gonna let any products come out of the market if there is any substantial serious effect. Keep in mind that when we have drugs for a disease, we have a greater tolerance of adverse effects because there's a tremendous benefit and you have to do a, a, a risk benefit analysis. But for vaccines, we have a very low tolerance of, of adverse effects because we're giving it to healthy people. We don't wanna make anybody sick. Thank you, doctor. Okay, next we have Dr. Bill Pettit. Thanks, Kat. I, I would uh, I would just reinforce that last comment. I'm on the science subcommittee for the vaccine advisory group, and the side effects of both the Pfizer and Moderna have mostly been low-grade fever, headache, uh, fatigue, uh, sore arm. Moderna people are going to hear about. There's three cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccinated group, and only one in the placebo group, which is going to cause some consternation. But at the, this point, there's so few cases, it's hard to make a determination. No one's sure if it's related or not. 
But my question I think is aimed at, I think Dr. Pollitt in terms of ventilation, I wonder if she'd make some comments on approaches to uh, nursing homes. And if you did it right in the middle, I'm, I'm sure I was uh, at a two minute uh, step away for a first grader. Um, but a lot of the issue in the nursing homes, do we need to think about retrofitting and putting filters at all the exit areas where the, it comes out or filters where the, the air is, is, is first gathered or what would be cost effective given the hundreds of nursing homes we'd have to do it, some a couple years old and some 50 or 60 years old. So that's a great issue. So uh, we're targeting air changes of five to six air changes per hour. And with that, uh, that means we're bringing in a fresh supply of, of outdoor air and then any air that's introduced into the room is then also uh, filtered through the air handling unit within the HVAC system. Uh, we also recommend that that HVAC system have at least a MERV 13 uh, filter installed and that will allow for 80% filtration um, across a range of aerosols. Uh, if there's any supplemental filtration that's placed within into the rooms, it's recommended that these portable um, air cleaners are used uh, rather than putting a filter just on the grill within the room itself. The portable air change or uh, air cleaners will allow for a much higher airflow that could then be um, pulling air through um, either a HEPA filter if it's a commercial available device um, or another MERV rated filter. Um, typically in MERV 13 we're recommending for the DIY units. Yeah, there's a number of interesting posts early on back in, in April with spouses of nurses, I guess their spouses were engineers who used uh, standard air conditioning filters to cut that material out to make sort of make their own K95 mask and found those to be, at least they thought, they thought clinically uh, effective. Um, are the, uh, you mentioned at one point that the surrogate use of uh, CO2, is that kind of device affordable by, by many people? Is that a very expensive device? No, and this is a technique that we use to monitor ventilation pre-COVID as well. Um, these devices can be purchased uh, for $100, $150, depending on the units um, off of Amazon or from a number of suppliers. I'm happy to send you um, some recommended units with a technology that's known to produce um, accurate um, results. The output can be streamed directly to um, a mobile phone, so you can monitor a number of devices across a facility. Um, and what I also find is having a very large display uh, of the monitored units where you have occupants in the room, so they're able to be proactive um, about ventilation and seeking the appropriate controls and increase if necessary. Well, that brings up then an interesting thought. So would you suggest, it's a broad-based question, the nursing homes, would you work on both the filtration and, and the monitoring and or would, would that, given the areas that those CO2 monitors came be, would that be cost prohibitive if you had to put, you know, 30 or 40 in the, in the facility? Right, so I mean, it, the, the cost will depend on the size of the facility and what the allowable budget is. And what we are recommending is that there be an increase in terms of the amount of ventilation, so the amount of supply of air to that space coupled with an increase within filtration. So just by increasing the amount of filtered air that you have, you need to have make sure that there's sufficient air that's being pulled through it. So you can have a HEPA filter in a room, but if there's no air being drawn through it, it's, it's ineffective. Um, and this is where we have these, these always this coupled ventilation and filtration is this, this pair um, when it comes to um, the disease control measure for airborne transmission. Thank you. Maybe we'll take one more question. Um, I know there's more than one question that is in the queue, but um, what we'll do is anybody that has a question that doesn't get to it, please email me your question and I will uh, get that answered ASAP and we'll send the link to um, this recording as well. So Kat, who's the final person that will take a question from and then we'll wrap it up. Who do you have, Kat? I'm sorry. Uh, Doug Dubitsky, are you still on, Doug?
Well, as we get the last question, I'm going to have to thank everybody and leave. I've got an urgent uh, thing to attend to and uh, want to thank all of you for organizing this and inviting us to join you. Uh, Dr. Pettit, thanks for, for the details on the vaccine. That was great. And uh, anytime you want to do this on any topic, we have 150 faculty in the School of Public Health. Half of us pivoted a chunk of our workload to COVID when it came along. So we do have a, 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 a deep bench to try to address any of the issues. And I know I speak for uh, Forrest and, uh, and Crystal and Zach, that if you have any questions for any of us, don't hesitate to get a hold of us. I've, I've passed on my, my uh, uh, email. So sorry, I've got to leave. Thank you so much, Dr. We appreciate it. Should I come back or should we wrap it up? Why don't we um, wrap it up since it's 3.02 now um, and we I know we had a hard stop. So um, I wanna thank everybody, um, Jillian, for putting this together for us too. We, we thank you very much. And for our members, please feel free to email me any questions you have, I'll collect them all and send them over to them and then send it to everybody along with the link to this presentation.